Welcome to a new episode in the Multiverse video series. Today we're going to learn how to use Delta Lake from R. Now, Delta Lake is somewhat related with Apache Spark, uh, but it's also somewhat a project on its own. So before we get started, let's take a look at what Delta Lake is. And in order to do this, I would recommend we take a look at a recent Spark Summit talk from, um, from Michael Ambrust. And, um, in this particular talk, he basically describes what's the difference between Hadoop and standard database software. So what, what you can see here in this, in this particular slide is that, um, you know, like basically traditional databases are really good at executing, executing SQL. Uh, they usually have a data catalog, which is very easy to like retrieve and why not tables and see uh, wh where the data is being stored. And um, they also have support for ACID transactions. So um, let's just take a look at what exactly ACID transactions because before we move before we move any further. So we, we don't need to know all the, the details and all the specifics, but basically ACID is a term that is usually, you know, related with database software. And uh, what an ACID transaction means is that it basically has four qualities when you modify data on a database that make the database pretty reliable. You know, so for example, uh, one of the properties is called atomicity. And basically what this property um, ensures when you're using a database is that a record is going to be modified and, um, you know, yeah, it's going to be modified one at a time without and by one, one at a time or transactionally, what I mean by that is that if you're modifying two or many fields or why not, uh, you, can, you can assume that the data is going to transform altogether or not at all. And uh, in, in a similar way, there's a couple other um, you know, characteristics that are important, like consistency and isolation, meaning, isolation meaning that you know, there's not going to be interference between multiple users when concurrency happens and why not. And uh, durability, which talks about um, kind of like the persisted storage and the characteristics associated to it. So we don't need to get into the details of what um, ACID transactions means, but in general, um, what is what is important to note is that uh, it's a characteristics of database systems that um, was not available in Spark until recently. So uh, let's take a let's let's take a look at this. So whenever you're looking at Hadoop and you're comparing Hadoop with other other technologies like databases, you know, like uh, Hadoop is really good at doing a distributed storage and why not? Uh, but uh, when you look at Spark, you know, we we have already covered in previous videos that Spark is much better than Hadoop for many reasons. Uh, one of them is you can also do th uh, do things like uh, SQL queries or deployer from R directly into Spark. And, um, you know, you can also use the catalog from Spark uh, through Hive and a new feature being presented also for Spark 3.0. What uh, hasn't really, um, you know, what, I ha what we haven't really mentioned in the past and which is a pretty new project is that uh, when you're using Delta Lake, um, you can also have ACID transactions in Spark. So, so usually Spark has not been like a great, um, you know, tool when, when, when data is coming in constantly, you know, if you have a table of like, um, you know, like revenue or like whatever. And when, if, if you want to analyze kind of like how that, um, table is changing over time. And if you happen to have a highly concurrent system where, you know, like things are being changed constantly, uh, then Spark usually, usually the way that you, uh, you know, solve this problem in Spark is, um, you know, by taking a specific snapshot of this particular data set that you know that is consistent. And usually you do this by extracting, uh, extracting data from the database. Now, what you can do with, um, with Delta Lake is actually use uh, Spark storage or you know, not Spark storage, but data uh, stored, um, distributed through Spark using Delta Lake without uh, having to worry about what is this current snapshot that 
um, and if the snapshot that you're taking is consistent or not. So, um, let, so let's take a look at exactly what Data Lake is on its own. So um, as you can see, Data Lake is its own project. Uh, the web page is deltalake.io. And, um, you know, the way that is advertised is as reliable data lakes at scale. And basically what this means is that you can assume the same reliability constraints um, that you would expect from a database when using a data lake. And, you know, therefore the name Delta Lake. So um, in a um, kind of like, uh, just take a look at the GitHub project, uh, you can see that First of all, it has a repo and the license is also Apache, Apache 2.0. So you can pretty much do with Delta Lake uh, whatever you want. So this brings us to the question on uh, what exactly do, I, do you need to do in order to use Delta Lake from R? And uh, for this, we're going to use also Sparkly R and the Spark infrastructure that we've already um, covered in previous videos. And uh, so this looks like as follows. So first of all, we want... We want to uh, we want to load Sparkly R, and we want to connect to Spark. Now, one restriction of Delta Lake is that uh, the only version that supports Del Delta Lake is uh, Spark 2.4. So um, you'll need a cluster with Spark 2.4 for this to work. Otherwise, it's it's just not available yet. And um, and and then um, what you want to do is you want to specify in your in your configuration the Delta Lake package. So uh, the way that you can do that in Sparkly R is just by specifying a Spark package. So we would say io dot delta delta and uh, delta core, which is just the name of the package, and then the version of Scala, and then the current version. Yeah, so if, assuming we got this right, we should be able to connect. And then what Spark is doing is, as part of connecting, it's also fetching the Delta Lake uh, project and making sure that it gets initialized. So after we connect, let's just look at a couple examples. Actually, let me just check that this is correct, should be. Oh, yes. So this should be correct. Oh, no, I, yeah. It's taking a long time, uh, mostly because I have this incorrectly. Um, yeah, this, this is not the right parameter. So um, what we want to do is we're missing, we're missing an S here. Sparkly r.shell.packages. Yes, that looks much better. Uh, master equals local version 2.4 and then we have our configuration file let's try that again right so the only thing that we're doing is mostly we're specifying uh we're, we're asking spark to basically load these uh the delta lake as part of the connection process so now we can do a couple interesting things so uh so the first thing that we can do is we can write into delta lake so for that, all, all, uh, I'm just going to create a simple data set. This data set, it's uh, pretty small. It just looks like a data frame with three numbers. Totally fine. This is just for kind of like um, understanding how Delta, Delta Lake works. And uh, then what we want to do in Sparkly R is we'll have to use the generic uh, generic table grider. And we're going to specify that the source, the source is Delta. All right, so we specify the source is Delta. And then we need to also specify the path where this is going to get stored. So let's just uh, call this path uh, delta delta one, I guess. Let's put it on temp as well. All right, let's just call it delta one. And um, this is pretty much it. Uh, assuming we have this correct, uh, when we basically save this data set, uh, it's just going to go to it's just going to go to uh, Delta Lake and get stored, stored in its own. Right, so uh, basically what is happening right now is uh, this is getting star stored uh, in true Spark in, in Delta Lake. That's it, stored, is done. And then we can read it back. And to read this back, we can also use the generic 
um, basically we're going to use the generic uh, reader and loader functions on Spark. And we do need to specify this as the path. And then the other piece that we're missing here is we need to specify that the source is delta. I think that's pretty much it. So now when we read this back, uh, basically, you know, even though even though it looks like a normal kind of like Spark source, what we're actually doing is we're reading and writing back from um, Delta Lake. Now, this is not yet that interesting. What, uh, but what we can do is uh, actually take some advantage of these properties. Well, not just the proper the acid properties from Delta Lake, but we can also um, use a Delta Lake for doing things like time travel which basically allows you to read any ver any previous version of your table at any given point in time. So let's just first try to override um, this table. I believe, uh, let's see if this works. We have to specify the, uh, the mode for this particular operation as override. We want to override the table. And um, and now if we read back from data lake, what you would expect is to see those four numbers, right? Let's see. Uh, yes. Yeah, so we would basically, um, you know, we're just writing, overriding, and why not? Uh, now, the really cool thing about Delta Lake is that you can specify also which version um, you want to use for reading from Delta Lake. And um, actually, for that, I don't remember. So let's just search for Delta Lake time travel. I think it's called, I believe this property is called version of. I'm almost sure. Maybe. Might be right, maybe not. Maybe. Oh, version as of. Okay, whatever. Um, right, so that's the name of the property. So uh, we can say Spark read source, all that. And you know, as as, as you were as, as we just uh, run in the previous in, in the previous uh, code execution, is that we got the four numbers right? But now we can also specify that we want the previous version, you know, the initial version, which is version zero. So what this should return is not the f total four numbers, but the state of the table at a previous point in time, which is just one, two, and three. And this is actually really really cool because it basically gets rid of all the problems that you might have when someone overrides a table over you. Or why not? And um, you know, if you were to connect also Spark with an online application, you know, like uh, with your actual web front end, and why not? Like um, you know, you pro you most likely wouldn't do this directly from R, but you know, if you have an engineering team that is building an application and it's storing all their transactional data in Delta Lake, what you can do as a data scientist is actually take consistent snapshots of all those uh, transactions. Uh, with Data Lake, with uh, you know, very very easily. Um, all right, so you can you can use Delta Lake pretty easily, you know, uh, with the current version of Sparkly R, as long as you have Spark 2.4 or newer, um, it's pretty straight straightforward as you can see. And uh, before we finish this video, what I want to show you is uh, two new functions that we're introducing into Sparkly R. So if you want to use these, um, you know. Uh, convenience functions when you're using Delta Lake, you'll have to install Sparkly R from uh, GitHub. So you would say remotes, install GitHub, and RStudio Sparkly R. Uh, now, I'll, I, I've already done that, so you don't, uh, you know, we're not going to run this particular code. Uh, but basically what this gives you is, it gives you a couple extra um, extra functions and a, a little bit of additional functionality. So first of all, when you connect, uh, now what you can do is say, uh, you know, say master equals local or whatever your your cluster manager is. You don't need to specify the version, let's say uh, 2.4. But since it's pretty tricky to remember this package, uh, what you can say now is you can say packages equals delta. And basically what that's going to do is it's still going to connect to Spark Connect in the usual way, but it's going to load the delta package. Um, we're also adding an uh, option to connect with uh, packages equals Kafka, uh, which would allow you to also load uh, Kafka if you, in case you're using streaming, which is kind of nice.
Anyways, so now we're connected and we can read from this table or write from this table using Spark read delta. And again, you would need the path. And that's it. That would reload the, um, the delta table. If you want to specify a, spe a specific version, you could say a version equals, and then uh, you want to specify the actual version that you would use to load this particular data set. In this case, we can say version equals zero. And oh, this one is, let me just pass it as an integer. Uh, so we're, say, we're gonna say uh, version equals zero. And basically what that's gonna load is the actual version that uh, we initially um, loaded into Delta Lake. And again, this, these are just two convenience fi uh, functions. You don't need to use them. You don't want to, but if, if you were already planning of using the development version of Sparkly R, or if you happen to watch this video later, later on, uh, it's likely that you'll have the latest version and you won't need to remember even what are the name of the packages. You can use the convenience functions and make use of Del Del Delta Lake quite easily directly in Sparkly R. All right, well, thanks for listening. I hope that this gave you a kind of like high level overview of Delta Lake and why it's interesting. And I'm also hoping, hoping that uh, you have the tools to use Delta Lake or at least try it out if you already have a Spark cluster or why not. All right, well, thanks again.